Good afternoon. Hello. 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 All right, folks, it's 12.30, we'll get started here. So we're going to be looking at, first of all, the easy rule for assigning stereochemistry to alkanes. Let me see how far we're supposed to get today. Something I forgot, oops. Uh, let me see. Okay, sure. Okay, fair enough. So most of you are familiar with uh, the cis and trans nomenclature that we have for the double bond compounds with the cis looking like having two hydrogens on the same side and the trans having opposite. We did this in the lab when we were looking at the, when we were looking at the, um, the structures of organic molecules lab. So when you've got a line structure, that's this. And when you've got a line structure like this, it's trans. I like to, I like to think of the cis as being looking like a cup and the trans as being looking like a, a zigzag. And, and what's important about this, but is distinguished from say a, an alkane is that these two things as an alkane are going to be the same. And could somebody mute please? They think of the dog in the background. And that's because there's free rotation around those single bonds. But when you've got double bonds, it allows for the possibility of isomerism, which means we're get, getting two different compounds here and there's no rotation about those double bonds. And you can see that when you were doing the lab, uh, when you were trying to twist those double bonds, you couldn't, you couldn't twist them. The single bonds though were fairly easy to twist. 
Now, the thing is that, yeah, that's fine if you've got hydrogens, but what if you don't have hydrogens on your double bond? How do we distinguish between different isomers with the uh, when we don't have hydrogens there? Then we've got to use something called the EZ system, which I hope you'll find to be EZ. So what we're looking at, for example, would be this one here where we've got a, the CC double bond. We have an I up here on the top left. We have CH3 on the bottom left, an F on the top right, and a CL on the bottom right. So what we do in order to kind of get some consistency with the whole cis-trans model is we talk about E and Z. E as being similar to trans and Z as being similar to cis. So what we're looking at, we split this down the center and then we assign priorities to the atoms directly attached to the seeds of the double bond. And we do this by assigning a mass number. So whatever the mass number is of that atom that's directly attached to the C, that's what we use to make the assignment for these priorities. So the one that has the higher mass number will have the higher priority. So if we look at the left side first, we have this competition between C, which has a mass number of 12, and I, which has a mass number of 127. So where am I getting these numbers from? Well, just from the periodic table. So you're looking at the periodic table, you look for the mass number. Uh, I've just rounded these here, 12 and 127. I have a quick question, Professor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So are we doing the atomic weight of the next atom or the entire branch? No, just the atom directly attached to the C. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I have to be real clear about that. A lot of the times uh, people will look at the entire branch and try and add up all the, uh, no, it's crazy, it's absolutely crazy. Now you might be wondering, oh, what happens if you've got the same thing attached. Well, that's a different story. We'll get onto that in a minute. Now on the other side, on the right side, we have F, which has mass number of 19, CL, mass number of 35. That means CL gets number one, F gets number two. And what we're looking at here is the arrangement of the ones and the twos. If the ones are sort of in a trans configuration, like a zigzag, we call that E. And if the ones are on the same side of the CC double bond, you know, when we're looking down the split here, then we call that Z. The way I like to remember it is with Z, they are on Z same side. Do, do you get it? Z, Z same side, yeah. And E's there on the opposite side, like that, yeah. All right, the, it's German, Entgenen for opposite, Zusammen, um, meaning the same side. Now you're not ever going to have to name these, at least not now anyway, not in this course, uh, but you will be re expected to be able to tell the difference between E and Z when given a compound. So this particular compound that we've got here is E. And if we were to name it, it'd be E1-chloro, 1-fluoro, 2-iodopropene. The E in here is for the double bond. I have a uh, question. Yeah, yeah, Hunter. So uh, I, I may have missed this, but um, for the functional groups attached to a carbon, would you add up the atomic masses of everything in the functional group or just the element uh, that is being attached to the carbon? Just the, just the element being directly attached to the carbon, Hunter. Okay. We'll, we, we will do some more examples of these as well. So here's another example. And in this instance, we have I and we have CH3 down one side. That one's pretty easy because it's a competition between I and C and I will win that one. But when we look over here on the other side, oh, we've got a whole mess of things going on. And if we look at the atoms directly attached to the C here, all we have is two Cs. So there is no difference there when we look at just what's attached to the atom. So what do we do? Well, we move on to the heaviest atom attached to that atom. 
And now the heaviest atom attached to this C is another C. It's not the hydrogens here, it's this C. What's the heaviest atom attached to this C? Well, it's another C. So again, we haven't, we haven't got a winner yet. We haven't got a competition. So that's the idea is we go out one, one at a time from the central element until we find a winner. So we look at this C and the heaviest atom attached to this C is an F and the heaviest atom attached to this C is a C. So the one that wins is going to be the one with the F on it. So that'll be priority one and this group will get priority two. Now I know what you, some, some of you are saying and, and Hunter and John, this goes directly to what you were asking about is you know, what, what happens when we've got all of these atoms? Do we add them all together? No, I mean, the thing is, you might be wondering, well, look at all these bromines over here. Why doesn't this get number one priority? Bromine's a really heavy atom. It's got a mass of 80, right? Well, the thing is, we never get to bromine. We never get there. Because we're able to come up with a change once we get to this point here and we say, well, C and C, no winner. C attaches to C, but we never get to the bromine. And here C attaches to the F, F beats C. So this gets the number one priority and this gets number two priority. When you say priority, is that uh, in reference to naming the compound? Yeah, it's, it's, so, it's so we could figure out, well, where the ones and twos are in relation to each other. So if the, and back to what I was saying earlier, where are we back here? If the ones are on the opposite sides, it's E. If they're on the same side, then it's Z. So that's what I, had we, a similar, I had a similar question, which uh -huh. is the point of what we were doing. And I guess it's to name it correctly. Yes, yes, because the thing is that there's no re, there's no rotation around that double bond. Okay. And, and if you take that into account, it means that depending on how things are arranged around that double bond, we get two different compounds. Okay. So we have to be able to distinguish between them, just like we do up here when we have the cis and the trans, where but, but if we don't have hydrogens there, how do we do it? The only way we can do it is to use this EZ nomenclature. Okay. Now the, uh, the other thing we need to consider here is branching. Now branching is a bit more difficult than what we've just been talking about. And branching has to do with when we've got one or well more than one C coming off a C somewhere on one of the side chains here that's connected to the double bond. So the way that we work the branching is that we've got C, C, no winner. Then we've got C, C, no winner. And you can see that this C is connected to a C and this C is connected to a C. So there's no winner there. But this C is connected to a CH3 while this C is connected to an H. So there is a winner here on the branching. Now I can make it fairly easy for you here and I can tell you this. Is that if you've got a situation, I'm going to do this as line structures because it's a little bit easier to see. Let's say you've got this situation going on here. What I can tell you is the one that branches first, that'll be the winner. So that'll get number one, that'll get number two. But it's based around what I was just talking about. Once we get to the branch, it's kind of like there's, there's two heavier atoms connected instead of one. So that's why it gets the priority out of, uh, out of those two. And if you've got a, a competition between anything branched versus anything that's just a straight chain, again, this, one, this one's the winner, the one with the branch on it versus the one with the straight chain. So branching will always win. What if the, uh, in, in your second example, uh, say the end of that long chain had an iodine on it? It wouldn't matter. Because we the never branching. get there. We never get okay. there. We never get to the iodine. Because once we get to this point, we've got a winner. So I didn't at the branch. At the branch. 
Go ahead. Go on. Are you saying branching in the last situation before you got here where the F was? Yeah. Should have we known? Oh, no, no, been? that's not a branch. That's not a branch, Julie. Why? Why? Because it's an F and not a C. When I'm talking about branching, I'm talking about strictly Cs. This is a okay. branch. This is a branch. This ain't a branch. This C is F here. That's not a branch. Okay, so okay. they all have to be Cs yes. in order to say branching always wins. Otherwise, that's you're right. still looking at You're still the looking other. at the atoms. Yeah, that's not branching then. Okay. All right. Thanks for the and, question. Um, another question. As far as splitting down the middle, we do that because... I guess this is a standardized way of naming compounds like these, like yes, an IUPAC thing. Is. It is. That's right. It is. Rebecca, I feel like you've been left out in the cold. Do you have a question? That's okay. Well, I was curious as you were going through the example, what I didn't understand was um, the first C's tied, the second C's tied, and then it was, you know, what was attached to it. And it just says one hydrogen on that top C. Mm -hmm. And it, it's probably irrelevant to the, in terms of like the, you know, prioritizing, but aren't there, I don't understand why it's just one H is considered. Does okay. That make sense? Yeah, I, I do. I, I get it. So we, it's like you said, we have C and C, that's no winner. C and C, that's no winner. Mm -hmm. And we, we go out and we see that they both have one C attached, but the other one, one has a, an, a C attached. The other one has an H attached. Remember it's going out to the heaviest atom directly connected. So yeah. the competition is between H and C, not H and CH3. Okay. It, right there it says two H's, but in another place it just had one H. Do you only consider one of the H's or both of them together? Well, again, it's, uh, it's whatever's heaviest. You, you choose whichever mm. thing is heaviest attached. To yes, but if it's two of the same thing, then you just choose one of them. Okay. So, so here it wouldn't matter which H you picked is what okay. I'm saying, because okay. they're both the same weight. Okay. Uh, Professor Musgrave, uh, yeah. in terms of the um, heaviest uh, element that mm -hmm. we're going with here, just to um, uh, reinforce it, we're going with the one that has the most, um, uh, the most um, electronegativity, right? No, no, the one with the biggest mass number on the periodic table. Okay, so... Um, so 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 on the left hand side here where we have where the um, element is i then mm -hmm. h three c c if it was like fluorine and br we would go with the one with the bigger mass number that's right and okay. bromine okay. would be fluorine in that example okay all right yeah all right any other questions. So when the reason that we went to the hydrogens directly attached to the C as opposed to moving forward to the next CH2 is what? Well, well, we couldn't get a winner by looking at these two Cs. So we had to go back to the C and ask if we could get a winner by looking at the other atoms directly attached to that C. And because the bottom part of that molecule has, um, has a CH3 attached, we stayed on the CH and went to the H's as opposed to looking at the other, the next C that's attached to it. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Can, can I give you, let, let, let me, let me reinforce that Rebecca, because I know what you're asking. Okay. I think. So let's say we've got this kind of situation. It's a little bit more simplistic, but let's say we had something like this. All right, so what would happen is, as you can see, there's, uh, there's no, no change, mm -hmm. no change. Notice they're, they're identical. Right. Right. But then when we get to, we get to this point, again, there's, there's no change, but you can see that they're not identical anymore because this one, this one has two C's coming off it, which means we can't get any, any winners there, but we can get a winner. Uh, out of going from you know this hydrogen here versus this C down here. Okay. So yeah, it's it's a point of change, I guess is, okay. is what I'm trying to, that to makes get out more here. Sense. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Now the this next part here is advanced. It's 
it's in the it's on the fun quiz, but it, you know we're not going to do any of these on the test. But I want to show you how we handle multiple bonds. So if you've got a C double bond O, it's kind of like you redraw it like this with the C connected to the O and the O connected to a C here. So everything becomes single bonded. And with the C double bond C, it's like we make it a two, two Cs. It's not like we're changing the compound. It's just that we're, we're changing the way it's drawn so that we can name it more easily because there's no real convention for handling double bonds or triple bonds in and of themselves. We have to change them to something that's more familiar. But I'm going to point that out because I do have some of these examples on the fun quiz, which is extra credit, of course. And I think I can make extra credit as hard as I like. But you can reference this if, you, if you're interested in doing that fun quiz. Okay, let's go take a look at some test questions and what those look like. Wait, before you leave that. Yeah. You're saying you can reference it, but I'm not really sure how you ref. Oh, okay. So you're just kind of looking and comparing. I'm not sure how you're comparing it. All right, well, let's say we had something like this, Julie, right? What you would do is you would redraw it like this. But what, what, so let's say I redrew it like that. I mean, how, how would that, how would I use it? Oh, well then, you know, you, you would treat that. Let's say, all right, let's put another thing down here then. Let's say we'd had that, right? We'll put okay. the OH down here. So what you would do is you would redraw this. So I should have not put that there, but then you would say, well, C, C, no winner, C, C, no winner. Now this C has a bond to an O, this C has a bond to an O, but this has a C to an H, and this one has a C to a C. So we do have a winner here. And that would mean that this why one. Why are you comparing this? Why are you comparing something so far out? I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry, Julie, I didn't get your question. Sorry, I have the dog from hell. Why, why would you be comparing something all the way out to the end there with something all the way in here? I, I don't understand. First one, the second one, the third one, one is an O. Right, but you know, uh, we're comparing the C to the C, there's no winner there. Right, there, but, but the but, C's got no, and the other one's yeah, got it. Yeah, but look, look at the, what's the heaviest atom attached to this C? It's an O, right? Right. And what's the heaviest atom attached to this C? It's an O again, right? So there's no winner there. So, but, but this C has another C attached to it, while this C has an H. It, this is a branching situation. Okay. So that one gets the so that one gets the higher priority. That's how you can use it. Okay. So like I said, you're not going to get anything like that on the test, but you will see that in the fun quiz. Sounds fun. Oh, it um, is. It is. I'm a little confused on how to redraw it. I'm not sure what becomes what. Oh, well, it's just exactly as it appeared in the. Let me pull this back up here. It's just how it exact exactly how it appears in the diagram here. So the, the C double bond O, you attach an O to the C and a, a C to the O. Oh, I understand. So, okay, that makes sense. I think yeah. I get it. Thank you. Okay. But again, you know, you got to you try some examples on the fun quiz and then you'll see. Let's take a, let's take a squiz at an old test. I, I, as you can see, I did add a couple of old tests. You can see my email. Some of you might not like my email, but well, that's life. So let's take a look at uh, at this situation here. Actually, that's a key. I, I don't want to. I don't want a key. Let me let me get a. Let me pull up a. Let me pull up a, an actual test here. I didn't mean to pull up a key. Let's try it again. Here we go.
All right, so th this is how you would look at it. You say B, R, and C, that's pretty easy. And what wins out of B, R, and C, folks? B, R. Broman. Yeah, and out of B, R, and I? I do. I. I, so this one is one, and this one is one, so this would be Z. All right, any questions? I just want to confirm, we only use E and Z for alkenes or alkynes. No, not alkynes. Alkynes are straight. They're, uh, they're linear. No, it's only alkenes. Okay, so only alkenes. Mm. And you also said that we were not going to have any uh, branching on the test? I, I didn't say that. Oh, I didn't, oh, I didn't okay. say that. I didn't, what I said was you wouldn't have any multiple bonds aside from the one in the middle here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's be let's be clear. <laughs> You're trying to pin me down onto something else here. Uh, I I had you I had your number on that one, Philip. All right. Let's have a look. Oh uh, yeah. Oh yeah. I like this one. I like this one a lot. All right. So on the first one, we've got C, C, no winner. Then it goes C and F. So hopefully you can see that it would be the bottom one that would win. Is everybody okay with that? Anybody have any questions? All right. Now on the other side, we've got CH2F and then CH2CHCI2. So again, we go C, C, and then it's F and C. So again, the top one wins. Is everybody okay with that? Again, you 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 know, I know you've got these two eyes at the end. Yeah, you know, I know I'm being a little bit tricky there, but you, we never get there. We never see the eyes. This is what I'm not okay with. <laughs> you're skipping the H's. You're just skipping them. Right, I, because we're always we're always going for the heaviest atom attached to the atom we just looked at, Julie. So then why aren't you skipping all the way to the eyes? Because the heaviest atom attached to this C is an F and the heaviest atom attached to this C is a C. I think it's um, the way it's written is causing a little bit of confusion here. It's in reality, the, uh, the C isn't really like all linear like that. The H's are kind of out of the way. And in the case of HC2F, you would have, the F being directly attached to the C as well as those H's. Yeah. I think it'd be more clear as like a line structure. Well, maybe. And you, if you wanted to, you could draw it as a line structure. Why don't we draw them out as a line structure just for kicks? Maybe that would make it more clear to you, Julie. Just to clarify, that one that you just showed us would be an E, correct? Uh, yeah, it'd be E, that's right. But let's, uh, let's take a squeeze at what this would look, look like as a line. So I would draw it like, let's see, you know, if you're more comfortable, let's see, CH, CH2, uh, C, C, and one more, right? And on the bottom, F, okay. And on the top, F, and on the bottom, C. Is that better, Julie? Is that a bit more clear? Not sure. You're not sure? I'm not sure. So, I, so, so C, C, no winner. C, F, winner. Okay. On the other side. C, C, no winner. C, F, winner. See, we never get to the I. Okay, yeah. Uh, it's by sequence and then priority. Yes. Uh, yes, I would say that's true, Victoria. I think that was Victoria. Uh, Professor Musgrave, just to um, uh, clarify something, hypothetically, if it was just C-H-I, would we also count the um, uh, little um, subscript there too, to, to make it two eyes? Yeah, you want to make it, yeah, as many eyes as there are. Okay, all right. Because two eyes would be better than one eye. Mm -hmm. But all I've right. always thought that true. That's always, two eyes is always better than one eye. Ouch. Elizabeth Taylor only had one I, but she also had two T's, an H, a Y, 
Nah. Anyway. Moving on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Are you just trying to confuse us now? <laughs> well, nobody here knows who Elizabeth Taylor is, but anyway, it doesn't matter. I think you're funny, Musgraves. <laughs> Thank I'm, you. I know who Elizabeth Taylor is. Oh, okay, that's good. <laughs> I'd like to see the next one on the test. I'm doing it now. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah, it's an interesting one. one. It's, a, it's yeah. an interesting one. It's an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Ooh, so, so we're looking at it. I, I will draw it out as a line structure just for kicks. Ah, here it is again. Got to move this over, unfortunately. All right. Okay, so I'll draw this out as a line structure. Okay, so on the left side, it's pretty easy. It's, it's F versus C, so we know which one wins out of those. Now, what about the other side? Who wins? They're exactly the same. They are exactly the same, aren't they? So who wins? Both. Well, let's not go with both. Let's go with the other possibility. Read the question. Read the question. Neither. 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 That's right. So neither. Now, Is there any electromagnetic? Electronegativity um, influence, though, on this mm, actual no, compound? Nope. Okay. No, the point is that you have a C there that has exactly the same things attached. That means if you were to switch those two things around, what change would you make? There'd be no change, right? So this is subject, not subject to E or Z. So it's neither. So you might be saying, well, let's, but what about this one? This one has the same thing attached. What's different though? This one is definitely, I think we said it was E, right? Okay, so what's different, the difference here? I mean, this one has the same thing attached. What's the, what's, how do I square that? Seems like I'm talking out both sides of my face here. Because they're attached on the other side. Yeah, they're attached to two different C's. In order for them to be neither, you have to have exactly the same thing attached to one of the C's. And it just has to be one of the C's, not both. See, my point is, if, if I was to take this and switch for CH2F with this whole grouping down the bottom here, if I was to switch those, that would change it from Z to E. I'll say it again. By switching these two, it would change it from Z to E. But if I was to switch these two on the other side that are exactly the same, or even the F and the CH3, there'd be no change to it. It's just not subject to E, e or Z. Does anybody have any questions? All right. Uh, if you put the CH2 on the bottom for the first compound, that it would change it from Z to E? Or E to yeah, Z? It would change from E to Z. Okay, that's because you had it backwards for a second. <laughs> oh, did I? Oh, sorry. Anyway, it would change it. <laughs> Whereas in the other one, it wouldn't. Okay, any other questions? All right, so there's a fun quiz. You can try that out. Once you, if Dev, we will you be using the same, the same system in order to name stereoisomers as well. So don't just uh, file this away, never to, never to remember it again, because we will be using it later. All right, the next one is pretty easy. This is about cis and trans as applied to cyclic compounds. And the idea is I was talking about how with alkanes, there's free rotation, but there's a situation that involves alkanes where there is no free rotation, and that is when you've got a ring. So what I'm looking at here is a ring that's, it's kind of, you're kind of looking, usually where we might be looking at a ring like this, 
But what we're doing is we're, I'm putting it on the side here. We're kind of viewing it from the side. And that's why these lines at the front here are thicker is because we're saying, okay, well, we're looking at this from the front. And you can see that if we have that, we've got two possibilities here. One, where the F and the CH3 are connected on the same side, and we call that cis. And the other, the other possibility is when the F is sticking down and the CH3 is sticking up. And that's relative to the plane of the ring. And what I mean by the plane of the ring is the ring is in this plane here. Right. Right, because if you're looking at it from the top, uh, perfectly from top view, you have no way to tell what direction the F and the CH3 not, are going. No, no, not unless. But I'm glad you mentioned that. But if we if we have a little bit of a change here in the way we present the bonds, then we can tell. So the, these these views are more like this, as opposed to this. Does that mean that we named the alkenes with rings wrong in the last test because they didn't have cis and trans on them? Right. Yeah, they weren't designated. So we actually, we wouldn't normally be naming things with rings like the way that we did. Well, it depends if, if um, stereochemistry matters or not. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't, Julie. If it's not, if it's a straight line, then we don't know what the stereochemistry is. And that's the way it was in the first test. What do you mean a straight line? Uh, I mean like a, a line that looks like this, you know, just a regular line that looks like this, Julie. As opposed to? As opposed to this situation I've got down here where you've got a wedge. Oh, okay. Okay, so we're just always assuming that it was just didn't matter. That's right, because we didn't know. We got a wedge or we got a dash. I'm not doing a very good job of drawing that, but anyway. Okay. Uh, right. I want to make sure I'm reading the chart right. All the ones on the left are the cis ones and all the ones on the right are the trans ones. They are, that's right. Okay. So well, the, the way that we're looking at this is if it's a wedge, then it's coming up out of the page. And if it's a dash line like this, then it's going into the page. So if you've got two wedges, it means they're on the same side, both pointing up. If you've got two dashes, it means they're both pointing down on the same side. And in the case of trans, if one's up and one's down, as you can see, there's two possibilities, but they're going to be, they're still going to be trans. Anybody have any questions? So look at the, looking at the kind of question you'll get on the test, draw and label cis and trans isomers of one bromo four ethyl cyclooctane. Let me try, let me, let me show you one more thing before we get on to that. Sorry about that. So this is the, the kind of thing that you'll be asked to do. So let's say you had to draw one, three difluorocyclopentane cis and trans. So you draw the cyclopentane, you'd put a fluorine on one and a fluorine on three, one, two, three. So you use that same numbering as we talked about in test one. And you can see I drew, drew a trans one here where one F was up and the other one was down. And the cis, I drew them both up, but I could have drawn them both down. That would have been okay. Well, yeah, Professor Musgrave, um, also something about the uh, numbering. Why, instead of starting in the um, bottom left-hand corner for number one, why not start in the upper left-hand corner for number one and just go across? I could have. I could have, but I have to start my numbering at one of these. Okay. So, so, so start so, anyway. All right. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so let's pretend one of those fluorines is a bromine. Yeah. Uh, how would you know which one is coming towards you and which one's going away? It wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter? No. All that matters is what they are rel relative to each other. If they're both up, then it's cis. If they're both down, it's cis. If one's up and one's down, it's trans. Gotcha. It you flip over the molecule. And it's, it's just... Yeah, it just doesn't matter. 
makes sense. sense. It's, it's all, they are relative to each other, right? Yeah. This one here, three ethyl, and the reason I point this out is the ethyl. The ethyl is a CH3, CH2, but we only draw, we only draw the wedge or dash out from the ring to the first carbon. That's because there's free rotation about that bond once we get to it. But we're only interested in just that, that, first, that first bond out to the C. So I'm just pointing that out there. So if you had something like draw and label cis and trans isomers of 1-bromo-4-ethyl-cyclooctane, What you do is first is draw your cyclooctane, which looks like a stop sign. And then one bromo, so you just stick a bromo off here, that's fine. And then four ethyl, it doesn't matter which direction you go, I'll, I'll go in this direction, one, two, three, four. There we go. So that's what it would look like if we weren't showing the stereochemistry. And that's probably not a bad idea to show what it would look like without stereochemistry first and then to draw it with the stereochemistry. And I'm going to choose to do this one for this where they're both sticking down. And then for trans, I'll do a wedge down here. And one, two, three, four, and a dash up here on the on the ethyl. That one would be trans. All right, so you'll definitely get a ring for question number two, and you just have to be able to to draw it from there and just apply the right one. People don't usually get this one wrong. Not generally. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question, but yeah. I'm not sure if I'm asking it correctly. Um, for isomers from the previous test, it was like, felt like endless possibilities, even though there is an end. But here, uh, you just want one one scenario for cis and one scenario for trans. That's right. That's it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's all I want. Okay, so you don't have to write, like, because there's two versions of cis you can do in two versions mm -hmm. of trans, so mm -hmm. you just want one or the other. Mm -hmm. okay. I'll know. I'll know. I think that's exactly what I was asking, too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> better way. Thank yeah, you. Just, just one of each. All right, if you want to draw them all, you can, but you'd be wasting your time. All right, any other questions? Okay. That's not too bad. Do you have a practice worksheet for these? Well, you don't really need one, do you? I mean, it's like I put in that email. This is one of those things that, uh, you, you know, I, I don't feel like it, I need one because people generally get this pretty much. I, I think you'll be able to get enough of it by looking at the old test. Okay, thank you. Seriously. Now I will. I do have worksheets for things that are more difficult. For example, the uh, the stereochemistry, the reactions, and all that. Yeah, I've got tons and tons of examples because those are the things that people struggle with. People generally don't struggle with this. Not generally. Uh, Professor Musgrave, uh, yeah. I'm just I'm looking at the current PowerPoint slide that you have up and the drawing that you did right here. Oh, it, they're they're not the same thing. Oh, okay. The, it's related, the drawing was related to this question that was on the old, on this old test. Okay, okay, okay yeah, that, that's just what I want to um, clarify, just to make sure the, um, um, the uh, darker shaded one, the one that's like a little more thicker, that's pointed mm. down, correct? No, the, this, this, this one I'm pointing at here, the wedge yes. is pointing up and the dash okay. is pointing down. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. All right, uh, I'm going to 
I'm going to play part of my video here. Now I'm going to be try and get smart about this if I can. Let's go back to share, share computer sound. We'll do that. All right. Ah, let's see. Newman projections. I should look at torsion angles. So. Confirmations, and we're going to start off with a discussion of torsional angles. Torsional angles are the angles between this hydrogen and this hydrogen down here. Now let's take a look at a different way of showing this. Now what we can do is instead of viewing it from the side like we are here, we can view it from the end. So our eye would be here and we're looking down this carbon-carbon bond right here. This carbon would be this carbon right here. And this carbon you can't see because it's directly behind this one. All right, so this is what I want to try to show you here. This is called a Newman projection. And what we're doing is we're looking at a molecule instead of you know, from the side here, we're looking at it from one end. And what that means is that if we're looking at this, because of the bond angles, they're all 109.5. But when we look at it from the end, you can see that it's really a circle that's been split into three. And if I'm looking at this top hydrogen here versus this hydrogen here, this is also attached to this same C. The bond angle between them would be 120 degrees. That's between this top one and this one down here. Is everybody okay with that? 120 degree bond, 120 degree angle between these, not that bond angle, 120 degree angle between this hydrogen on top, this one, this, this one down here. Wait, how means, do you know that again? Because it's a circle, and if you split the circle into three, that's 360 divided by three, which is 120. Gotcha. But if you compare this angle on, of the one on the front, with this one at the back, because this hydrogen here, the small, see how they're, they're different sizes as well? This one is, a, this one's the bigger one, that's attached to the front C. This one is actually attached to the back C, the one I'm pointing at, the one with a small circle on it. And the bond angle there would be half, it'd be, sorry, the torsional angle there, it'd be 60 degrees. So the angle between the one on the front and the one at the back, that's called torsional angle, that's 60 degrees. And also think of it that uh, there's no way a carbon can bond to six hydrogens. Well, that's well. exactly right. So yeah, there's a C behind this C that we're not seeing. And because we're looking down directly right down the barrel of this C and we don't see the C behind it. Is everybody okay with that? These mm -hmm. two, two views are the same thing. One's from the front and one's from the side. That's really, you know, it's like, You've got this view or this view. Notice that, well, you can't really see my thumb, right? <laughs> you can here. <laughs> now it's gone. <laughs> Where's your nose? I got your nose. <laughs> it's kind of like that. Anyway, that's torsional angle right there. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay, all right, all right. Enough silliness. Force projection, where we're showing the height. So what I'm showing here is what's called a sawhorse projection, and it looks like a sawhorse. connected to each, and in basically trying to show their orientation to each other. But we're not we aren't interested in sawhorse projections here. We're interested in Newman projections. So what we're doing with the Newman projection, and it's really the same thing, is we just sort of shift everything around. So this C is going to be at the front, and this C is behind it. And we've got a we, we need a way to differentiate between the the H's that are attached to the front C and the H's that are attached to the the C behind it. So this is what we do. And the hydrogen's connected to the front C. 
So what we do is we draw a circle. And to this circle, we'll connect hydrogens that are connected to the back C. Now you can't see the back C to read. So this is the front C that I'm pointing out here, which is this C right here. The back C we can't see because it's directly behind that C. Is everybody okay with this so far? Yeah. Uh, yes. Could we also just kind of draw shorter lines coming out of the center? No. Sorry. The only way. No, no. You have to. This is a Newman projection, so we're going to draw it. We're going to draw it as a Newman projection. And what we what we do is we put a circle here, and then we attach the the H's to that circle. And those H's are the ones that are attached to the back C that we can't see. All right, any questions? Does this only work with two carbons? No, it doesn't. But it does, well, it does work. We're only viewing, but we're only viewing down two carbons. But I'm going okay. to show you examples of where, where we have more than one carbon, more than two carbons in the chain and how we handle that. So if like one of the H's was a carbon, for yeah. example. Yes. Okay. Yes. We'd, still, we'd still be treating it the same way. Just that the H would be a C, but we'll get to that in a minute. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Looks like we're going to do that right now. So if we were to, this is, an, this is me drawing an eye, by the way. It's not a very good eye, but that's an eye. Look down this one. And we do that. So this is sort of in answer to Jonathan's question. What happens if you have more than one C in the chain? Well, you have to know what CC bond you're looking down. And I'll always tell you, I'll always draw my really poor representation of an eye to let you know which bond we're actually looking down. But we're looking down this middle bond right here. And as you can see, attached to that C at the front, we're going to have a methyl, which is going to be sticking up, and two hydrogens. And on the back one, we're going to have a methyl and two hydrogens as well. Will the bond angle uh, also on that front C also be 120 degrees between yeah, the hydrogen? It, it will. It will. It, that's never going to change. We'll uh, have a dot here representing the C. Now connected to this C, I see a CH3. I also see two hydrogens. Cs. Right. Does anybody have any questions so far? The CH2. I'm going to show those. So on the test, you'll show us like which one we're supposed to be looking at for the. Guarantee. Barrel chain, whatever you want to call it. Okay. Yep. I got. It. Now the bond angles around here are going to show that there's actually going to be 120 degrees apart between everything in this view right here. I draw a circle. Now I look at what's going to be attached to the back. And what I'm going to have is two hydrogens and this methyl group down here. And that would be the Newman projection for that particular molecule. All right, so take a look at that. Make sure you can understand how I drew that Newman projection and what's attached to what and where it came from. So does it matter where we put the CH3s versus the hydrogens? Because I know you were saying one is up and one is down. It kind of does because of the way we're looking at it. And it's pretty clear that the, C is, the CH3 on the front is pointing upwards and the CH3 on the front is pointing down. Sorry, CH3 on the back is pointing down. Gotcha. The molecule in reality would probably also want to have those methyl groups as far away as from each other as possible, right? Yes, but you are stealing my thunder. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but that's all right. Okay. Let me get out of this. All right. But that's a good video to watch. We're now going to look at some of the changes oh, hang on. that are occurring oh, in butane go. as it rotates. Oh, all right. <laughs> what we're doing is we're looking down this bond right here, this CC bond. So what we're going to do is we're going to rotate this around a little bit and then we're going to start rotating around that CC bond to see what kind of energy changes are occurring. So we are starting with this C pointing down at the front and this C at the back, CH3 pointing upwards. And we're actually going to start with that. And then we're going to look at the energy changes that occur as we go through this. Okay, so watch carefully as I do this. All right, so we're moving the molecule around. 
See that? Moving it around. So now we've got this bond at the front, this carbon at the front, and we've got the carbon behind it. And we're going to rotate this front, this front carbon around. Now at the moment, we're in what we call the anti configuration. Now the reason I call it anti is because you've got these methyl groups at 180 degrees from each other. So, so we're talking here about torsional angle again. And the angle between the methyl at the front and the methyl at the back is 180 degrees. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I don't see that. Okay, so you've got a methyl here that's pointing down and a methyl here that's pointing up. And then when we turn it around into a situation where this C is behind the other C, Julie, then you can see this will be have 180 degrees between each of these methyl groups. Straight line. Is that fair enough? Yeah. The torsion angle there is 180 degrees between the methyl groups. This is the lowest energy conformation because the methyl groups are farthest apart. So there's our energy right here. Now I want you to keep it. Yeah, that's not zero. That's not zero. That's not a zero energy, it's just low. Relative to everything else we're going to talk about, this energy is the lowest because the methyl groups are furthest apart. Mind. That energy when you um, spot, uh, talk about energy, you're talking about um, potential energy. Yes, that's right. right? Mm -hmm. It'd be something much higher than zero, but it's just drawn down here because it's going to get higher as we rotate this. So watch what happens as I rotate it. I'm rotating at 60 degrees. And what that's going to do is it's going to cause this methyl group and the hydrogen behind it to be eclipsed. And this hydrogen, which is in front, is now eclipsed with the methyl group behind it. So now we're looking at a different kind of conformation. We call the previous conformation, and by conformation I mean just a relative orientation of, of groupings here. This is called staggered. And this is why we use Newman projections is because we can see staggered and eclipsed very easily. Staggered means that there's no overlap between the front and back. But if I've got eclipsed, there's eclipse there. You can see there is overlap between the front and the back. And what I'm saying here is that if you've got overlap between the front and the back, that's going to be a situation where there's higher energy than there was when they weren't, weren't eclipsed. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just picturing this thing sort of turning in space. Yeah. And my question is, what is moving around what? Well, actually, it doesn't matter. What I've done here, you can do it either way, Julie, but what I've done here is I've kept the back the same and I'm moving the front. So you're saying that the C's and all, like everything's spinning around each other? Yes, but we have to, we need a frame of reference. So I keep the back the same and I rotate the front. Okay. And uh, I have a question. Is it um, the potential energy increases because you're bringing these electron densities closer together, exactly. which puts strain on the Ex molecule, correct? Exactly, exactly right, yes. That is exactly true. So when you draw, a, when you bring an H closer to a CH3 that's on another atom next to it, that's going to increase the repulsion between them. So how would this occur naturally in, you know, in the environment or whatever? Does this occur naturally or is this yes, just yeah, us yeah. messing with the molecule? No, 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 no. This, this occurs all the time. There's enough, there's enough heat just from ambient temperature to make this happen. You can, gotcha. you can cool, you, you could cool this molecule. You'd have to cool it to say probably, if I had to guess, 50 Kelvin in order to stop it rotating. Gotcha, so the rotation, like you're saying, the eclipse has more energy than the staggered. Mm. So when it heats up, it's getting more energy as the electrons become closer. That's right. going to happen as I go another 60 degrees 
is we're getting to another staggered conformation. All right, so we go another 60 degrees, and as you can see, the methyl group, remember, started down here at the bottom. Then it was eclipsed, which was a high energy, and now it's staggered again. But look at the relative energy compared to anti and gauche. And you can see that gauche is this situation here where the methyl groups are closer together as opposed to anti where they were opposite. And gauche is not as high as eclipsed, but it's low, but it's higher than anti. Anybody have any questions about that? This staggered conformation is called gauche. Now this methyl group is the one on the, in the front. This methyl group is the one behind. The dihedral angle between these methyl groups is now 60 degrees as opposed to 100. Dihedral angle, torsion angle, same thing. 180. That means that there is some interaction between these methyl groups. And we can say that the conformation we're calling gauche is going to be of higher energy than the anti-conformation. But it's not as high as the eclipsed conformation that we had earlier. So staggered conformations are always lower energy than eclipsed conformations. But the gauche is higher energy than the anti-conformation. The anti-conformation, if you remember, was this one back here. And there's our gauche. All right, does anybody have any questions about anything I said there? So to keep something in a stage, you'd have to control its temperature? Yes. Okay. And Just I mean, curious. If Sorry. you start in the right anti-conformation, it's going to follow this pattern? Yes. Every time, or is it just for this particular no, molecule? No, every time. And I can but promise you- But the trick you, is starting in the correct yes. conformation. Yes, but if you, but the thing is that it's always drawn in such a way that, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> one will be drawn up, one will be drawn down. So it's always sort of drawn in an anti to begin okay. with. Okay. So just go with that. Okay. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Say this were this molecule is a liquid at room temperature. It won't um, be. We're talking about gases here. Oh, uh, we're talking about gas? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. yeah, because we don't really well, I guess there is free rotation probably in liquid form as well, but I think things are different then because you've got intermolecular forces that are also going to mess with things more than they will in a gas back in a gas phase. That makes sense. Okay. Rotate this around another 60 degrees. And this is going to make the two methyl groups eclipse. And that's going to be the higher energy of all of them because now the methyl groups are directly interacting. This is so you can see that's how it's going to be. We're going to start off with the lowest energy it's going to be eclipsed, then we go to gauche, and then we go to the place where the two methyl groups are eclipsed, and that's going to be the highest energy of all of them. Then so if that was rotated to the side, the other side view, it'd be like the cup formation you showed us earlier? Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in general, these cup formations would be more unstable than the other ones? I'd say that's true with the, the sort of the more trans-ish, but it's not really trans, anti being the lowest all the time. Situation. We'll move it around another 60 degrees and we're back to gauche again. This is the same energy as the one where the methyl group was over here. Move it around another 60 degrees, and we're going to get end up at the same eclipse conformation as we had earlier, except the methyl groups on this side. Move it back, and now we've got the anti. So this is what your energy profile is always going to look like. Because, Rebecca, to sort of piggyback on a question you had earlier, anything I give you will always have such as something replacing these methyl groups. Could be anything, but it doesn't matter what that thing is. And whatever we get is always going to have that same energy profile every okay. single time. That makes sense. 
Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Hey, Dr. Musgrave. Yeah, yeah. Uh, doctor, uh, um, sorry, the energy profile is only pertinent to gases, though, right? Not liquids. Yes, I'd say that's okay. true. I'd okay. say that's true. I believe that's true. Could we see an example of this on the exam? Oh, why not? I think I might do that. That's where I was going to go. <laughs> I read your mind. You did, didn't you? Uh, let's take a squeeze. Now, this one I do have a worksheet for. And it's in the Newman Projection Examples folder. And here he is here. And there are examples of all these here, see, as along with, along with answers. Yeah. All right, so we've got that. Newman projection. Always reminds me of Seinfeld in here. He says, hello, Newman. Uh, all right, let's see. There we go. So there's the question, that's what it looks like on the test. As you can see, I've got the I here, and that is an I, whether you want to believe it or not, it's an I, and it's always looking down here. What varies are these groupings that are going to be attached to each side, but I always stick the first one, the one on the, on the front of the I upwards and the one on the back downwards like this. It doesn't matter what these are actually, it's just going to always be the same thing. All right, let's go take a look at the answer. Go take a look at the answer. What I'm looking for here. Well, I will. I'll show you how to do how to do one of these in a second. But I just want to show you what the answer being looked for is. So there you go. So it says draw the potential energy diagram for rotation of the following compound. Looking down the bond shown, draw Newman projections for each rotima at all maxima and minima. So each one of these we call a rotima. It's kind of like an isomer. You can think of it as being like a rotational isomer. So we start at the front here as anti, and anti has the BR and the OH in different uh, you know, opposite positions, but the OH is at the front and the BR is at the back. Is everybody okay with how I'm drawing the anti there? Anybody have any questions? Now, when we're drawing the eclipsed, and this is, this is where things get a little tricky, because we can't really draw it so that one is directly behind the other, what we, draw, what we do is we kind of offset the ones at the back a little bit from the ones at the front, but not a huge amount. Enough so it's clear that there, it is eclipsed, but not so much that it looks like it's not eclipsed. So you can, you can see that's what's, been hap that's what's happened here. And you'll notice that there are uh, bond angles, uh, sorry, uh, there are degrees of rotation here to point out the dihedral angle. So we've got zero degrees starting out at the anti. We rotate at 60 and then we get the first eclipsed. We rotate at another 60, that's where we get the gauche. And we rotate at another 60 and that's where we get our second eclipsed. This, this one's really good actually. They did a really good job on this one. Does anybody have any questions? All right, let me do one. I'll do one from scratch so you can see. All right, this one's a good one. Get my so the first thing we do is we'll draw our, our graph here. And the graph is going to look like this. You'll have energy on the y-axis and you'll have degree of rotation. on the bottom axis. We always start at zero and then we'll do increments of 60. All 
right? Because that's that's always going to be where the maxima and minima are going to occur. The peaks and valleys, if you will. That's what I mean by maxima and minima. The first one we're going to draw will be the, the anti, which I'm going to purposely draw a little bit up from the x-axis. So it's not implied that it's zero. And I'm going to call that anti. And anti is going to look like this. So I'm looking at the front C that I'm pointing to now where the I is. And you'll see that above it, it's connected to an N. And that N is connected to a C, which is connected to an ethyl. So you'll have a methyl and an ethyl connected to that N. And on the bottom here, we have the two hydrogens. Does anybody have any questions about that interpretation of what I'm seeing here? If you don't want it, you can draw it as a line structure or not. What about the um, um, OH bond? I, I haven't done that yet. I will get to it in a second. I'm just looking at the front right now, Philip. Okay. Any, anybody have any questions about the front here? Now at the back, I've got the OH sticking down and two hydrogens here. Does anybody have any questions? Now that's anti. I have a question. Yeah. Are we going to worry about um, any rotations with the functional groups coming off of the nitrogen? No, because we're only looking down one specific bond, this one right here, this CC bond. That makes things much easier. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Now, is there rotation? Yes, there is, but I don't care about it. All I'm interested in is rotation around the bond I'm looking at. So that front one is always going to stay stationary and the one behind it is gonna be the one rotating. Actually, you can do it either way, Sierra, okay. you have, but you have to decide which one you wanna keep, which one you wanna keep still and which one you wanna rotate. Okay, I'm, gotcha. I'm actually going to keep the front still and rotate the back because it's a little bit easier. It's yeah, the, the front one is a bit more complicated. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, it's a little easier looking at it too. Though. Yeah. So that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the front the same and rotate 60 degrees. Which means, and it doesn't matter if you rotate left or right either. But I'm going to put the OH here. I'll put the H here and I'll put the H here. This would be, I'll call it eclipsed one or E1. And that's going to be a high energy here. That'll be E1 after 60 degrees. All right, any questions? So I rotate it again around another, another 60, again, leaving the front the same. And that puts the OH in this position now. This is gauche. And that energy is lower than the eclipse, but higher than the anti. And we've got one more here around, again, around another 60 degrees. And and this is going to be what I'm calling E2, where the OH and the nitrogen group are eclipsed. And that's going to be higher than the E1 even. That's what it's going to look like. That'll be 180 degrees. Now, the rest of it is just mirrored from that point. It goes back to gauche and back to E1. Whoops, a little bit high. 
and then back down to anti. So it looks like this. I have a question. Yeah. In this class, would we relate degree of rotation to temperature? Mm, not really. Because it's going to be spinning regardless and it's still going to have the energy, same energy profile. It's just how fast it spins. All right, anybody get any other questions? So that would be a complete answer there. I have a question. Yeah. Is E2 eclipsed? It is, but, okay. it's a, it, but it's a different flavor of eclipsed than the, the other one, Deanna. Okay. Is E3, is there an E3 or is it just no, an E1 it's, again? It's just E1 again. Because the, the, one on, the one I'm pointing at over here for the arrow, that's going to be E1. Again, so there's no need, it would just be repeating the same thing. That's why I only that's why I only draw those four, because those would be unique ones. You could draw all of them if you wanted to, but then again, it's a waste of time. And this energy diagram is the sum of potential energy in the molecule, correct? Well, I would just say potential energy in the molecule. Yeah. Total total potential energy in the molecule. Yeah, I'd say that's true. All right, any other questions? On the class notes, you have five different um, diagrams. Is there a, a limit to diagrams you're gonna test us on that we'd be able to review or? Well, oh. you've got, well, you've got these and you've got, I think, if, I think after doing the, the ones on the worksheet, there's five of them, and then you've got uh, another six on the old test. I think you'd be okay. Again, Francisco, this is not something that people have a great deal of trouble with. So once you've once you've done enough examples, I think you, you you'll be pretty good with it. All right, any other questions? Okay, well we'll leave it there for today. And uh, you know what one one thing you could be doing you could be doing that worksheet and you could be doing examples of everything we covered today you can also watch the videos for the ones that we're going to be doing on wednesday so that can that can help improve things as well but read that email uh, i know some of you are going to be upset by it but well it's a, it's the truth as i see it and if you want to uh, if you want to contact me about it that's that's okay as well we can we can talk all right. I'll see you all on Wednesday. Have a good Thank one. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. You.